good afternoon everyone and welcome to the inaugural public webinar webinar hosted uh, by the Charlotte campus of Borden-Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, my name is Adele Jordan and I serve on staff at the Charlotte campus. I'm also a graduate of the MACC program and I'm a practicing mental health clinician. Um, our goal today is to aid pastors in counseling congregants who pastor congregants and recognizing when it is appropriate to refer to a mental health professional. Um, our MACC faculty will serve as our panelists and will cover separate topics within this realm. Um, Dr. Cook, Dr. Chris Cook will be covering differentiating between spiritual and mental health concerns. Dr. Vicki Macklin will be covering the impact of culture and Dr. Pam Davis will be covering knowing who, when, and how to refer. Each of the counseling faculty will speak for approximately uh, 10 minutes on each topic, and then we will open up for a Q&A um, session. If you have questions along the way, you please enter them into the Q&A feature, and we will get to as many as those, as those questions as possible. Um, also, if you do have other topics that you think are helpful for pastors, um, for us to cover for pastors, feel free to also um, enter those this time in the chat box so that we can um, serve you well going forward in the future. Um, as part of this event, we want to pre, um, present you also with a referral list for some of our counseling alumni, both at the Hamilton Boston area and the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So um, as you're looking for resources for counselors, we have we are building our alumni list of active uh, counselors, and we are going to eventually be posting that on our website so that you have that available to you. Thank you so very, very much for joining us, and we hope that you find this very useful um, for you going forward as you serve um, your congregations. Um, I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Chris Cook, and he will um, be presenting on differentiating between spiritual and mental health concerns. Thank you, Adele. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to have you all with us. Um, just wanted to start by giving you a, a, an idea of what's going on in churches that you may not be aware of. Um, it's estimated that approximately one out of five church attendees has some kind of mental health concern. That's a pretty significant number of our congregation. Um, further research tells us that it can be difficult for pastors and lay ministers to differentiate between mental health concerns and other kinds of problems that can contribute um, to, to issues that our congregations are having, like um, misunderstanding or um, misattributing mental health to some kind of sin. Um, research shows that pastors mistake mental health concerns sometimes for either demonic possession or parenting concerns. And then uh, we can misattribute mental health concerns to things like lack of faith or some kind of spiritual um, lethargy. And so there's just a, a wide range of issues that can be confused for mental health concerns. The problem is that when we um, misdiagnose or mis, uh, misattribute these concerns, uh, mental health concerns to spiritual concerns, then we often approach them with ineffective forms of help. And that just really translates to care that is not as good for the people that we're serving and the people that we're ministering to as it could be. And in some cases actually can be harmful to them. Um, so what I wanted to do is just uh, talk with you a little bit about spiritual concerns, how to, um, you know, how to think about spiritual treatment approaches, and then um, how, to, how to be able to think about ways to differentiate between those two. And of course, this will be a very brief overview. Um, first, I think it's important to recognize that there is a difference between discipleship, pastoral care, pastoral counseling, and then mental health treatment. All four of these things really are designed to do different things to help people. 
Spiritual concerns that we are aware of um, include things like understanding and dealing with feelings of guilt. Um, this, this can be from things that people really have done wrong that they feel guilty about. It can also be misattributions of guilt. But a spiritual concern certainly is how do we help people walk through the process of seeking forgiveness, granting forgiveness. Um, it can be spiritual concerns can, can include specific applications of scriptures. So how do we take uh, what we learn from scripture and from our theology and how do we apply that, help people apply that specifically to their lives in a in a theologically and biblically, biblically consistent way. Certainly helping people grow in their faith is another uh, spiritual concern and helping people deepen their relationship with God. All of these things I'm sure you are familiar with as pastors, as, as ministers. Um, these are ways that you help your congregants all of the time. And so we have a lot of different ways to help people in these different areas, one of which is discipleship. And I would think about discipleship being this idea of having some kind of deep, vulnerable, and reciprocal relationship between two people or between a group of people. Uh, often, more mature Christians are helping less mature Christians uh, cultivate relationship with, uh, relationships with God, developing spiritual maturity, a walking together through life, particularly the spiritual elements of life or the spiritual com uh, component of life. And older, more mature uh, people giving younger, less mature people practical uh, help, practical advice, uh, recommendations on, on what has been helpful or useful for them. Um, but that is, is a reciprocal relationship. Care ministries are another uh, of these, what I would call spiritual treatments. Um, in other words, ways that we try to attend to these spiritual concerns. Care ministries, I think of as um, groups or ministries that are primarily geared towards listening to and being present for one another, seeking, helping people seek God together, often meeting physical and practical needs. Um, in terms of the care part, a lot of that is, as I said, just the listening, listening to people, being present for them. Uh, Paul Tillich said, the first duty of love is to listen. And I think that is a, a really key point for care ministries. Another way that uh, we, we engage in spiritual treatment is through healthy communities. You know, think of the scripture, I, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And this is often what's going on in uh, our communities and healthy communities, or it should be going on. And then finally, I uh, would we'll draw your attention to um, the use of spiritual disciplines. So cultivating prayer, um, using silence, meditation, learning how to worship and worship well and live a life of worship. There's, there are many of these uh, spiritual di uh, disciplines. But these are things that we typically use in a church or spiritual context to try to help people um, work through spiritual concerns and spiritual issues that they have. Um, so how does that differentiate from mental health concerns or how do we recognize or how do we understand um, thinking about mental health concerns in a different way? Well, Mental health concerns often are more long-term problems, um, which often require longer treatments or different treatments. Um, when problems are severe, meaning they cause significant di dysfunction in more than one area of life, then maybe you start to think about, well, is there a mental health issue here beyond the spiritual concerns that I have? When discipleship and care ministries and healthy community and the practice of spiritual disciplines, those spiritual treatments, as I referred to them, when those demonstrate limited effectiveness, then you might start to think about, hey, um, maybe there's a mental health issue here. Maybe there's a concern here that um, 
goes beyond spiritual care or is different than a spiritual concern. And I, I would just want to emphasize that we don't see mental health uh, treatment and spiritual uh, care as being, you know, m- more severity on uh, of the same issues, but rather we see them really as treating different conditions. Um, I, I would, I would never say or or think to say that someone's salvation, for example, which is primarily a spiritual concern, is uh, less severe than some kind of mental health issue. Um, And so just like medical care is also a different kind of care, we see mental health care as being a different kind of care. However, one of the the, um, difficulties or often confusing parts of this conversation is that there is just a lot of overlap between mental health concerns and spiritual concerns. And so, for example, um, just two quick examples. Um, I've worked with uh, people in my congregation when I was pastoring who I came to realize had bipolar disorder. Well, they were engaging in from a spiritual religious perspective, they're engaging in things that we would often think about and consider to be immoral, impulsive behaviors like sexual immorality or the use, the abuse of drugs and alcohol or overspending or gambling. Certainly there's a spiritual and a moral component there, Um, but we would be doing them a real disservice if we completely overlooked the mental health component or the mental health issue of someone with a bipolar disorder. The other example I would uh, turn to is that of addiction, where you have individuals who are caught up in addictive behaviors. And of course, there's certainly um, spiritual concerns there, moral concerns, but there are also uh, significantly deep medical and psychological components to addiction. So I'm going to um, stop there. And I think that um, that can give you a little bit of of an introduction to this uh, difference between mental health concerns and spiritual concerns that then Dr. Uh, Macklin and Dr. Davis will be able to elaborate on and then bring you to some really practical steps for referral. And that does um, lead really well into the impact of culture as it relates to um, uh, considerations that really do do need to be um, uh, taken into consideration when providing services um, to clients or to Um, uh, individuals in the congregation, Um, it's really important, (coughs) sorry, I have (coughs) have allergies, so I may be taking drinks of water ever so often, (coughs) excuse me. Um, you know, it's, it would be really easy to, um, look at your congregation and to think, oh, there's no cultural issues in, in my church. Um, and that would be a mistake, um, because culture, uh, is very broad um, when when we think about it, and it influences us. We all grow up in very different uh, in homes. The environments that we um, are are uh, immersed in, uh, we all learn very different things um, when we grow up. Um, <clears throat> I. Uh, grew up, uh, growing up in uh, a Black family, um, 
church was a, a very important part of that that environment that I grew up in. I learned very early on that um, that if I didn't go to church on Sundays, um, there was no doing anything else after. If I wanted to go out and do something after church, if I hadn't gone to church early in the day, uh, earlier on Sunday, then I wasn't doing anything else after church. And, and so that was a part of the makeup of the Macklin home, <clears throat> the Macklin Robinson home. And there were things in that home that were a part of my environment. So the, the, that went to church with us. And so it would have been a mistake for our pastor to not think that each family in that church had those types of things going on. And to think that just because he looked out on that congregation and saw all of these black families and thought, well, we're all alike, <clears throat> he would have been um, making making some mistakes. So each family has culture. And so that's one of the important things to keep in mind um, that even though you may look out on your congregation, um, especially if it's a congregation that is of the same racial group or the same um, race, race, the same background, uh, a racial background, don't assume that you are all the same. Um, and that goes to one of the things that Dr. Cook was just speaking of, because there are things that are influential in families um, with regards to um, mental health issues that can um, be uh, uh, genetic, that can um, play a part in families. And so um, that's how culture can influence, can impact um, uh, the involvement um, of mental health. Um, another aspect to think about as it relates to culture is, um, and this comes into play, if you are pastoring or leading um, involved in leadership in a, a multi-ethnic ethnic or multi-generational church, um, that that includes some additional factors. Um, and many churches are multi-generational, even if they are um, of the same race, because you have young generations, um, children, um, adolescents, um, you have parents who are um, in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. And um, so you're talking generational issues also that need to be considered um, when you talk about culture. Um, so culture is more than just, um, uh, there are issues as it relates to culture that we need to, to consider and in this impact of mental health and how it can influence um, a person's makeup. Um, you know, when I think of my own family, there was a time when there were five generations um, and in the makeup of those five generations, my, who I am um, and how I was influenced factored into how I saw myself, how I, how I engaged with my world um, and how I still engage with my world, how I see 
others in my world um, and within a family that can be a factor too. Um, so it's important in the system of a, a in the system of a church to think about the system of a family um, that that family system um, may not may not function like the family system of the church and um, incorporating um, uh, the aspect of um, mental health um, and and in including mental health in how you are involving yourself, um, the church, with the system, with the family, um, really can make an make an influence, make an impact um, in how that family uh, feels involved, feels connected, um, feels accepted. Um, so those are, those are some effects of how culture can play a part. And what I, what the other piece that I want to, um, emphasize as it relates to culture, when it comes to a multi-ethnic church, um, is the leadership in a multi-ethnic church, is really important to realize the cultural dynamics um, com com that come into play in our society need to be um, need to be acknowledged and need to be addressed and need to be um, a part of the community. Uh, need the, the, those who um, the best way that I can say this is differences need to be addressed and seen, acknowledged, heard all that goes on in our in our society are a part of the church and the church needs to recognize how how systemic um, racism systemic um, uh, issues have affected, uh, mental health of people of color and how that also comes into the church with people um, in multi-ethnic uh, churches. So while we celebrate multi-ethnic churches, and I do, um, um, as I'm a part of a multi-ethnic church, I'm also very aware that sometimes in multi-ethnic churches, um, issues around um, uh, uh, um, the broader cultures, the broader issues can sometimes get ignored. And in that ignoring those issues, harm can continue to happen, which can create further um, issues around problems around um, mental health problems, mental health issues. So yes, they're all tied together. So that's what I'd encourage um, when there are multi-ethnic churches that there is a tie, there can be a tie to mental health issues because stressors that can be created um, 
And even when you're not a multi-ethnic church, even when you have individuals in your churches, if you are of, of um, primarily a Caucasian church or primarily a Black church or primarily an Asian church or primarily a Latina church, if you've got people of different races in your church, just being aware of the cultural, um, of the different, of different uh uh, people groups that might be coming to your church and how that they can be affected uh, in those churches too. So um, th that's just some pieces I would add to what Dr. Cook uh, had to say. So, and I'll hand it off to Dr. Davis. All right. Thank you, um, Chris and Vicki. Um, I am Pam Davis, Dr. Pam Davis, I'm the director of the counseling program in Charlotte uh, and also teach several courses here for those of you who may not know who I am. And my part of this uh, webinar here for about the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk on some very specific and practical ways how we know when we need to refer um, a client out. And then we will have probably 30 to 35 minutes at the end to address your questions. So we see a few questions coming in, in the Q&A box. Um, I just want you to know that that's the best way to uh, submit them is through the Q&A box and we will absolutely address those in our Q&A time. Our hope is that this panel discussion today, this webinar can actually scratch you right where it itches, which is your specific questions. But uh, just as I think through this idea, um, what I want to share with you is um, how do we know we lost you? Okay, I don't know why that hit mute. So for some reason, it suddenly just went on mute. But how do we know when we should refer that person on? And we're gonna put um, a link right now in the chat box. And I'm also gonna share my screen uh, to the document that, uh, that I'll be sharing with you all. But you will actually have this document available, made available to you in the chat box right now for you to download on your own. But it's exactly the same as what I'm sharing on the screen. And I think the first thing we know that of when it's time to refer is when you have met several times with a person or a couple or a family and there is no improvement. So you've met three times, four times, six times, and you have the sense that whatever you're doing doesn't seem to be enough. Um, that could be a marker for you that hmm, maybe what's going on here is a bit deeper than pastoral issues, than spiritual issues, uh, than baseline issues. Another way that um, you can really know as a church leader when to refer is when you are addressing spiritual matters, but it does, for some reason doesn't seem to be enough. It doesn't seem to be effectual. Now, please hear me when I say this. When I make this statement, it doesn't mean that's, that God can't heal everything or that the spiritual isn't enough. So I want to just kind of um, make a caveat here to my thoughts that I actually believe that God can heal anybody and anything 100%. It is, it is part of the core of my faith belief uh, in God that God can heal us. However, I think perhaps all of you have come to the uh, have been in the position before where you are meeting with someone. So let's say, for example, and you talk about God's, perhaps they're having struggles with how they see themselves in Christ. And we're in, you're sharing that in your own counseling with them, that, that here's how we can apply God's unconditional love and God's forgiveness. And you share that, but it, for this particular client, it doesn't work. Now, what we know is that that should work. It should be enough. It should be enough for people that they're able to appropriate these theological truths of who they are in Christ and that it should be able to make a difference. When it doesn't, it should be a, aha, maybe this is something beyond a spiritual matter. Maybe 
there's a mental health issue in play here. Another time as we go down this list, when it might be a marker for you that it's a wise time to refer is when you recognize that there are other family dynamics in play that need attention. So perhaps you're meeting uh, with, let's say you're meeting with a, um, a woman in your congregation and as you're meeting with her, you discover that, oh, maybe what's going on here is some marital issues some parenting problems. Uh, maybe one of the things that she's talking about is um, that her, that what you sense is that her distress or her anxiety or her depression is linked to something in the family. And so, so often what we see and a time that referral can really be helpful is uh, when there's all these complex interrelated family issues going on. Another one, and this is a really big important one, I really wrestled with where to put this one on the list because to me it's a big one, which is when there are urgent uh, warning signs. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, if someone makes a threat of harm to themselves or to another person, that is an urgent warning sign that you need professional intervention. Um, if there is something very complex, like an eating disorder, someone brings to you that they or their daughter um, or their son has an eating disorder. Uh, eating disorders are one of the very short checklist of things that cannot typically be managed in um, just in a spiritual or church-based or faith-based non-professional setting. In fact, even for those of us who are professionals that work with eating disorders, we engage an entire team uh, just because eating disorders are so complex. So that's one of those like, mm, this is kind of urgent, this is beyond me. And, and that the same then would go also for severe addictions. Now, I do believe firmly that some addictions can 100% be handled in the context of, of pastoral counseling and of church counseling. Uh, I think the church has done a fantastic job of engaging and addressing, let's say, pornography addictions in the church. And we've seen a lot of movement in that area. Um, but then there are, this is a great example, like a pornography addiction that perhaps as a pastor you're, and a pastoral counselor, you're helping uh, your parishioner with that, but there are other family dynamics in play. It's uh, impacting the wife or it's impacting uh, the experience of the children in some way in the family. If you see that occurring, uh, that's a time to refer. And it would be, and then there are sometimes someone brings to you an, uh, a more serious addiction, maybe an alcohol or drug addiction um, that is very entrenched in their lifestyle. And quite often, uh, while we can refer them to some of our in-house programs like Celebrate Recovery, uh, which are fantastic and which I'm all about, uh, there are also times when for severe addictions, you really do need to also have professional intervention. And then the last one is when as you sit with this person, you sense in your gut, this is beyond me. And I think we've all had that experience when we are sitting with someone and we're like, boy, hmm, I have no idea what to do next. Now, I will say, even as a professional, I sometimes don't know what to do next. And I pray in that moment, okay, Lord, help me know what to say next here because uh, this is a big one. But I, th I think what I'm getting across here is think about your personal intuition Sometimes as you're meeting with a client and recognizing, hmm, I don't have what I need here. Some of the key markers uh, that is beyond your training or expertise is when you begin to feel a bit anxious as you're sitting with that person of, I don't know what to do next. Or perhaps when you feel uh, it triggers an incompetence for you of, hmm, boy, I feel like those are all the markers that you might come to that all of these things, um, these are times when you can refer. And then finally, just as I um, close up my part of this and we open it up to questions, which I do see are coming through. 
<clears throat> the Q&A box. Also wanna say that we've put in the link for you um, a list of referrals that are Gordon Conwell alumni, whether uh, regardless of which program they've graduated from, we do have a beginning list of referrals for you that we are making available today too, uh, that we hope will be helpful to you. With that in mind, I'm gonna turn it back over to our moderator, uh, Adele, to handle the Q&A time. Thank you, Dr. Davis, Dr. Macklin, and Dr. Cook. Um, one of the questions we have is, how would you go about addressing the intersection of mental um, health issues and race of, of the context if the context doesn't acknowledge issues of race, would that be something to refer outside to? Let's try to get that again. How would, how would you go about addressing the intersection of mental health issues and race if the context doesn't acknowledge issues of race? How um, would that be something to refer outside? I will. Um... I will begin by addressing that, sorry. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll address it from what I'm, what I, at least what I'm thinking I'm understanding. And if there's additional clarification that's, that's needed. Um, you know, sometimes, especially if it's a client of, color, uh, someone who is, um, who may be talking with, um, if the, the, the pastor or the um, pastoral counselor is white and that, that other person that they may be speaking with is a person of color, and I, I will speak as a black person. Oftentimes, the um, the meta the meta message um, is an issue of race, even though it may not directly come out. Um, and so, I I think a part of how that can be addressed um, is just to boldly and courageously inquire of the person how how is their experience in your church it, especially if is a if if the if the person is uh, of the is one of a few individuals um, in a dominant uh, in, in a white church, and they are maybe one of a few in the church, what, I would just inquire of them what their experience is like. Um, yeah, I, I think for me that might um, communicate a sensitiveness um, communicate a cultural awareness, communicate um, yeah, just a, a, a cultural sensitiveness about from the, the from your part, the person who's asking the question, about how it is for them um, to be, even if even if you're not aware it's related to a mental health issue, just just to be sensitive. And I, I think especially in in the climate that we are in today, um, as it relates to many of the racial issues um, in our climate today. So that's what I'd say. Thank you, Dr. Macklin. Here's another question. 
Have you ever seen demon possession to be a true concern, especially to those who are made vulnerable by mental health concerns? Have you ever seen demon possession to be a true concern, especially to those who are made vulnerable by mental health concerns? I'll speak to this one. Um, I think that there have been a few times in my life and in, in my ministry where I have seen something of this nature. Um, my personal experiences have, have not been such that I can say for sure. Um, but scripture does speak of demon possession and there are a variety of ways to interpret this. You know, I think some, some people interpret this as, you know, that culture's understanding of things like mental health concerns. Um, but we would certainly agree that there, uh, there are spiritual realities that um, certainly uh, go beyond our un understanding in spheres of uh, medicine, uh, psychology, so I think that um, one, of the, one of the kind of guidelines that we can use, or one of the ways that I think about this is, first of all, I'm very careful to label something uh, demonic. Um, and I think the reason for that is because it certainly can be, uh, I mean, you know, not to be re redundant, but can be demonizing of the person, the individual. Um, I have seen things labeled as demonic or things that have labeled uh, in the sphere of demonic possession that have then subsequently been treated with mental health treatments and the concern or the symptoms have gotten better. So is that a, is that a misdiagnosis? Is that, um, is it that, you know, somewhere in the process of the mental health treatment enabled people to, um, uh, to interact better with scripture and with God and with their uh, religious community. And that's what helped. Um, so of course, this is uh, like many of these, a topic that is um, too long for us to dig into fully. Uh, but I think that uh, one of the things that we do is, is we try to avoid labeling things demonic prematurely, and uh, we look for some of those spiritual treatments that I talked about, discipleship, uh, spiritual disciplines. If those are not helpful, we go on to mental health treatments. Um, and if mental health treatments can uh, have an effect on it, have an impact, then we don't need to uh, try to look for uh, a demonic source. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cook. Here's another question. How would you train lay congregants or ministry leaders to triage or refer concerns for pastoral counseling or mental health professionals? Example, concerns discovered via prayer requests or personal interactions. So the question is, how would you train lay congregants or ministry leaders to triage or refer concerns for pastoral counseling or mental health professionals? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take a stab at this one and jump in here. First of all, I want to address the end of the question about, for example, concerns discovered by a prayer request or personal interactions. This is actually really common. And so I would say fantastic to that. Like, look for that, because that is actually very often the way that uh, people who are in a church first express their needs is would you pray for me or to reach out to a friend? And all of that is appropriate in what we know of how uh, the body of Christ should work. So, and then I would say, as those things come up, you know, how to train your lay congregants or ministry leaders, I think you can start with that little sheet that we're making available to you about the five times, uh, the five kind of markers of when to refer. It's a, to me, that's a great baseline of if the person's feeling outside of their competence, if there's a lot of complex family dynamics at play, if uh, addressing the spiritual matters and praying with people and doing some discipleship doesn't work and isn't enough. So just kind of thinking through those categories can often be 
uh, very helpful, I think. If I could, I would just add, you know, there's um, opportunities that churches have to uh, bring someone in from the outside who, who does know about mental health and can identify mental health um, issues and uh, for them to do short, simple training with people in care ministries, just to be able to recognize and spot some of the most common concerns like anxiety disorders, depression, trauma, uh, things like that. There, there are some markers that those people in care ministries could learn that help them say, yep, maybe we need to, to contact a mental health professional. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Cook. I have another question. I'm gonna shorten it quite a bit. It says Dr. Heath Lambert um, defended the Bible as sufficient and an authoritative guide to counseling and cast doubt on the efficacy of secular therapies such as cognitive processing therapy, EMDR, and the use of psychotropic drugs to treat depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other mental health concerns. What are your thoughts on advising pastors regarding the need for a balanced approach between biblical counseling and the mental health community? Um, again, oh, Chris, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. Okay. Again, this is such an important question. I'm really glad it was asked because I think it's something that comes up over and over again of uh, if we really believe the Bible is enough, then why do we need trained professionals, mental health professionals? Why is the professional I'm going to using something like a cognitive processing therapy or an EMDR? Uh, such a great question. And what I would say as I answer this question is that um, we are first, the foundation of this is that we are made in the image of God as biopsychosocial spiritual beings. So what that means is biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. And it's very often difficult to separate those out. Um, and so when we have a spiritual concern, um, when we have, <clears throat> excuse me, when we have a spiritual concern, it impacts our physical and our mental and our emotional and our psychological and all of those different areas. Keeping that in background, what I, what I would like to say is that as we consider a balanced approach between biblical counseling uh, and mental health is that all truth is God's truth. So any truth that we have in the mental health community actually comes from God. To me, it's very similar, and therefore, it is part of the knowledge given to us. To me, it's very similar to, um, let's say, someone who develops type 2 diabetes. And perhaps the reason they develop this disease is because of their poor choices, their poor lifestyle choices. As a result of their poor lifestyle choices, they um, develop diabetes and God has given knowledge to the medical community and to doctors of how to assist through things like um, using nutrition counseling. That is not in the Bible, by the way, nutrition counseling and how to uh, specifically how to eat to help ameliorate a diabetic condition or uh, using insulin management and other, other drugs, other medications to help assist with the diabetes. To me, it's very much the same. And we cannot separate and say that um, mental health should be treated differently than physical health with the knowledge that we have that we've been given by God. Yeah, that's great. I, I would just add to that that I can't speak uh, definitively to that particular article as I don't think that I've read it. Uh, but the the concepts um, I'm familiar with, as far as I'm aware, um, the Bible itself does not claim to be an authoritative uh, training manual for counseling. Um, I think some of it is uh, some of some of these objections, I think, are based on uh, false premises. Also, I would just say that we use 
uh, psychological uh, ideas all the time in other contexts, and we don't think twice about them. When we consider um, pedagogy, how do we teach well? Uh, how do we preach in such a way that people will listen to us and they can take away something meaningful? Those ideas come from the study of psychology. In other words, you know, social psychology, how or, or communications theory, these are psychological ideas. Um, leadership has a lot to do with what we've learned from the field of psychology. We don't think twice about accepting uh, truths that have been learned from these fields in these other contexts. Thank you. Um, here is another question. Therapy in the black community is very taboo. How can we get more pastors to lead by example and consistently attend in therapy to promote mental health wellness? <clears throat> I will um, take a stab at this one. Um, and I, I wanna, I want to say yes, um, it is, it is taboo. And I also want to say it is beginning to change. Um, I'm, I've been finding in some pockets of the Black community that we're beginning to see more and more um, Black pastors, um, at least some Black pastors that I have been engaging with um, who have been seeing open to communicating um, more, more and more with their congregants about the need, the value of being willing to acknowledge um, that we in the Black community need to be willing to share about our our uh, our problems, um, but these pastors, I will say, have had opportunity to engage um, with um, mental health professionals like myself, other counselors um, who have taken the opportunity to go into their um, into their their communities. So, you know, I learned very early. Um, my dissertation was, I, I learned from, from my own work that if I wanted to do work in the Black community, I had to be willing to engage in the Black community because Black pastors were not going to invite um, anybody in. They were not going to refer people to me if they didn't know me. So, um, and I'd say that that's true for, I encourage those who I, it, the students that I work with, as, as I talk with them about, if they wanna have an, have an investment in the black community, they've got to get to know black pastors. They've gotta get into the community. And I, I think we're seeing that at least, I'm, I, I'm seeing that in the Char in Charlotte area. So I think as, as more and more um, pastors, black pastors um, are seeing an investment um, and more and more black pastors are getting the word out. I think we're seeing a change um, in that, so. Thank you, Dr. Maglin. Um, another question is what very practical st steps can white people in a congregation take to help reduce the racial angst, inequality and injustices that African-American people face in our churches and in our country? What practical steps can white people in a congregation take to help reduce the racial angst, inequality and injustices that African-American people face in our churches and in our country? Well, I think this question could have a full day seminar. 
Um, and it would be really challenging for us to even begin to unpack it. In fact, I feel fearful to answer for fear that it will seem like I'm minimizing it um, just in even trying to answer it. So let me start by saying that, but I wanna maybe bounce off a little bit of what Dr. Macklin just shared, which is it starts in relationship and in hearing the stories. So what personally can white people in a congregation do? I think uh, to address and help reduce this racial angst, I think we can start with relationships, with hearing the stories of our black and brown brothers and sisters, with developing relationships with them uh, about how they're doing, how what's going on in parenting with them, uh, how are their kids, and, um, and really listening to the stories. And let me just say this, and I probably am gonna leave it because as I said, this is really big to unpack and so important. Uh, and as we listen to the stories and as we ask um, about stories and as we develop relationships to remain non-defensive, what about what we hear? Because I think for many of us, as we begin to engage this and begin to step in to these stories of racial angst and inequality and long-term injustices, uh, sometimes white people, we can feel uh, defensive, we can feel attacked, uh, and you know we can feel like we don't want to address this. And so what I'd say is to then have humility in your presentation and in your responses to just listen uh, without defending back. Very short answer. And to the person who asked the question, I just want to affirm again, it's really important. And I know we probably haven't done it justice uh, in this short answer. Thank you, Dr. Davis. The next question is, how can I best help someone who is a Christian and has a solid biblical understanding, but who has been badly abused and mistreated and cannot believe that God loves her? She feels that God loves everyone else except her. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to this briefly. Um, honestly, I think the best thing that you could do would, would be to refer that person to a counselor. Um, these issues of love and God's love are often deeply connected to how people have been treated in their caretaker relationships as they're growing up. Um, as they uh, develop uh, either healthy or unhealthy attachment to their caretakers and then to other people, um, that can have a very significant impact on one's ability to perceive God uh, accurately and often um, the uh, aspects of the relationships that have been really damaging can be imported into one's view of God and who he is. And so my best recommendation is help them to take the step uh, to get in to see a mental health counselor. Thank you. Uh, the next question, it says, um, Pamela, you mentioned that there's a short list of issues that cannot be treated in the church or spiritual setting. Can you share with us that short list? Uh, probably not, no. But what I mean by that is I think I don't actually have a true and definitive list, although the big ones I did say already uh, in my presentation, which is I think eating disorders, I think severely entrenched addictions, and I also think I'd add one more that I didn't say, and these are just very broad, but eating disorders, severely entrenched addictions, and um, long-standing patterns of personality disturbance. So for example, if you have uh, something like a, uh, something like a schizophrenia, uh, there are sometimes severe mental health issues that come into your office because people will start with a pastor. And in fact, I will say sometimes you see more severe issues in the church because they've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. So then they say, I'm going to try my pastor. And so I think it's actually a pretty common place for pastoral counselors to be facing um, severe issues. But all that to say, uh, I see that the person who asked the question here, I don't actually have a real list that I was saying that to. Maybe my colleagues want to answer other things they would add to that. I would add um, major depressive disorders. 
Um, when you have individuals who are suicidal, um, you want to you want to be definitely be really careful uh, to refer them to a professional um, because that individual really does need uh, professional help. Individuals who have severe anxiety uh, disorders, you want to get. Uh, you want to have, and and that's where I would say this list that Adele or Dr. Davis is going to refer you that you have some referral individuals, um, folks that you trust in your back pocket that you can refer uh, professionals, uh, professional counselors in your back pocket to. One one final thing that I would add is just that we're not at all suggesting that the church has no role to play in the lives and the health of these people. Um, these people still are going to need spiritual care and a community that really loves them and is willing to nurture them. And so we just want to, to be very clear that we're not suggesting mental health care in place of the church, but rather in addition to the ministry that the church has to offer. Okay, thank you all. Here's another question. How should we handle referrals when the person doesn't think they need help in the first place? You know, kind of the same way we do. <laughs> you can't, you can't, really, you can't, you can't force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. I mean, you can refer them. We have a referral system in my church and my church, they refer people to, they've got a, a base of psychologists and counselors that they refer to, but even when they refer them to us, if they don't come to us, so that's, that's just my simple answer. From a pastoral perspective, I think that a lot of times I was getting people who just wanted it to be handled in the church. And they thought that their pastor or the pastoral staff or the care staff could address their needs. And so just saying something for, for some people, not for everyone, but just saying something like, um, you know, I've listened, I've listened to what's going on in your life and I would really love to help, but in order to get you the very best care that you can, um, I, I really think that, this is beyond my ability to help you. Just something as simple as that can start them on the road to considering uh, making a re uh, taking a referral. Okay, and moving on, how would you recommend a pastor deal with his or her own trauma while shepherding a congregation? Dr. Cook, I think this is your special question. I mean, trauma can certainly impact how a leader um, interacts with his or her staff and community and congregation. But I would not say that trauma disqualifies someone from ministry. Um, I would say that a pastor um, or a minister needs to be a good leader for his or her congregation and get the help that they need from a, from a, a professional that's trained to deal with trauma. Um, and then as that person heals, as that leader heals, they will be a light and an example to the people around them and as other people see them being healed and growing, it will be a testament to that pastor's leadership, to the work of the mental health community, and also to the Lord for providing those opportunities for healing through a variety of ways. And just so you all know, I'm going to brag on my colleague, Dr. Cook, here for a minute and why I passed that uh, question to him is because he does teach our trauma and counseling course here at Gordon-Conwell in the summers. Uh, and he also was a pastor uh, in his 
previous life. And I don't say that in any kind of uh, way, except our Christian understanding. Before he became a uh, seminary professor, he was a pastor. So that's why I thought it was a great question for him. Thank you. Next question is, in case of unavoidable referral, how would the ch how the church should proceed in order to provide continuous care? So how should the church proceed in order to provide continuous care and show concern towards that individual? So when you are referring, how does the church continue to provide continuous care and show concern? Well, again, I think this is actually such a great question because it really is uh, very common. And I think that it, it's most helpful, Dr. Cook, I think you might have alluded to this a few minutes ago, that it's most helpful when we do make a referral that we continue on in the church to provide support for that person. So that might be in our areas like uh, maybe if you have in your church some of the support groups available, that's one way you can do it. Um, I was part of a church once when I lived in another part of the world where we developed care teams for people in counseling. And what I mean by that is we would refer the people, uh, This and this was again before I was a professional counselor, we would refer the individuals to counseling, but we would also create a care team uh, for the person of three to four people that they chose that met monthly with that person no obligation for the, that care team to report to the counselor or anything like that, but just an added measure of support of, we'd like to set up a care team for you that meets monthly with you so that you know we can ensure that things are going on track, uh, that we can offer, provide practical support if you need it. So that's one way you can do that. Okay. Um. So as a lay person, I had a friend with complex issues of alcohol addiction affecting her life and the ability, inability to keep a job or maintain friendships, relationships, along with demon possession, which included changing of voices and inappropriate laughter, um, demanding and way moving control of life. Um, I chose not to engage with the demon and later was given from God that is the name of the demon, bringing it up, bringing it up to my new interim pastor. It was ignored and remains unattended. She is having a professional counselor for her mental health with depression and has since started going back to CR. As a friend, I have yet to explore this aspect of our relationship in this manner. What do you suggest as a role I can play in her walk with Jesus. Do I bring up the demonic session? Do I leave it at rest? I have experience and been present and helped in several group sessions with demon possession, but not ongoing relationship as it was on the mission trips within my country and overseas. So I think that this is a very specific question um, that will, that probably has a very specific and individual answer. Um, and so like, I think the question here at the end after explaining that she's walked in many different ways uh, with this person is, should I bring back up the demonic session or should I leave it at rest? And how do I engage with this person now? I think that's the way I'm understanding the question. And what I would say is you engage that very prayerfully. And I think that in this situation, you do have to be certain that um, the Holy Spirit is leading you in what you would have next. I would say for all of us who are Christian counselors, both those who are professionally trained and those who are lay and ministry trained, a big part of what we do is relying on uh, the Holy Spirit to know when to speak and when uh, not to speak. And then the second thing I would say is you, the person who asked this question does say that they have had some training and some experience in uh, demonic possession. And I think that that's really important too. So to lean in to the training that you've had uh, and perhaps even seeking out mentors who have also walked in those areas because there's nothing like the power of a good mentor and a good supervisor when you're in a really sticky and specific situation like this one that you described. 
Okay. And moving on, the next question is any thoughts on how to destigmatize mental illness in the church or congregation? Um, relatedly, how to quell potential gossip? And this gossip refers to uh, members who gossip about, about congregants or their families with mental health illness, um, which could be an issue, especially for smaller or rural churches. I think one of the most powerful ways to destigmatize it is through the uh, acceptance uh, and communication of these issues from leadership. Um, my experience in churches almost universally is that there's no voice as powerful as the voice of the pastor. Um, if the pastor um, speaks in a way that uh, uh, enables people to uh, disclose areas where they're struggling and suffering, um, disclose areas where they have needs, and um, enables people not to feel like um, a second-rate Christian or a marginalized Christian when they can admit uh, areas where they're struggling, that's going to go a long way towards helping people be open enough to talk about their problems, to talk about situations where they need help. And then if the leadership um, makes it known that there are um, sources for referral, that is in essence an endorsement of this kind of uh, treatment and care from the church. So I think it starts with, pastors and leadership teams. Um, and I think that it is a, it's a long-term project um, because I know that there are pastors um, and leadership teams that don't, um, you know, that, that, that don't feel comfortable with mental health uh, treatment or mental, mental health aid. And so, you know, taking that, um, in those churches, it's, it's going to be much harder, I think, to to destigmatize mental health concerns. It also happens through places like Gordon Conwell, where we uh, do teach our graduates in a variety of different degree programs about mental health issues um, along the along the path of their journey here. Thank you, Dr. Cook. We do have quite a few more questions to go. So I'm just going to keep going. And um, if you are needing to leave because of time, go ahead and do so. We thank you for joining us. And we hope that you've gained some good knowledge and some help with them um, working within their congregations. And, and for those of you who can stay on, we'll probably go on for maybe another five minutes to capture a few more questions. So the next question is, what should be our immediate steps if someone does threaten to harm themselves or in meeting with them, you sense that this is something that could happen? I would say call 911. And I, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I don't mean that as a glib answer. If you believe that someone is threatening harm to themselves, that really is outside of your professional expertise and uh, either call 911 or if you happen to have available to you the crisis hotline for suicide. Um, there are some great hotlines for that in our area here, but I actually know that people in this webinar are from all over the world today. So I don't wanna make it uh, Charlotte specific, but call your local crisis management uh, referral. Okay, and the next question is, I think we've pretty much covered this before. It says, how can the church address the shame associated with mental health issues? I believe Dr. Cook, you mentioned that earlier with the destigmatizing of the mental health. If anybody wants to add anything, please do. Otherwise, I'll move on. Okay. How would you help a congregant accept a referral if that congregant resists or comes from a culture that rejects the methodology of Christian counseling, therapy, or psychiatry? Well, 
Well, I'll just echo what Dr. Macklin said in a previous comment, which is we really, we can't make people, I think sometimes the harder we try to get people to see that um, Christian counseling or therapy is a godly uh, category and that this really isn't against the scriptures, sometimes the harder we try to do that, it can become very polarizing. Uh, because this is, and I think, you know, you can recognize that when we end up with any kind of issue that's polarizing, whether it is mental health, or whether it is political, or whether it is racial, we lose. So I think it's very key that we seek to not polarize this issue as this is what you must do, but instead to provide good modeling uh, for what is helpful. And we talked a little bit earlier about some of the language that you can use to talk about um, um, how we are integrated beings created by God with needs in all of these areas. Okay. And I think even including in that, you know, like just finding out from the person what it is that they, they feel like they need. Um, you know, if they don't feel like it's counseling, what it is that they feel like is going on with them. What, why do they think someone is recommending it? Um, so, because they, we, we also want people to feel like they can be heard too, and not just someone's telling them what they need to do. Okay. Thank you. Is the Christian community at large aware of the la long lasting effects of narcissistic abuse on the identity of a person who has been in a chaotic context with someone who has strong traits of narcissism? Narcissism. I will just say in, in my experience, the answer to that is no. The, the Christian community at large is not aware of the effects of narcissism. And I would say that that is um, it, it can be very damaging that we aren't aware of it to uh, our congregations because ministry does seem to be one of those professions uh, as a, along with others um, that does seem to attract uh, narcissistic individuals to leadership. Um, uh, what can be done about that? Um, you know, individual help for those individuals who have been abused and then just greater awareness uh, and education for primarily for um, the church institutions themselves, people who are in the position to be able to make decisions about leadership in specific uh, churches. Okay. So the next question we have, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not repeating ones that we've already covered. Um, sometimes it seems like everyone in my network of pastors and ministry people are in counseling long-term, myself included. Sometimes it seems like this is used just as a means of having someone to process ministry with or have someone to talk to. Is this an appropriate use of counseling or how do you know when to stop going to counseling? Um, Go ahead, Dr. Macklin. You know, speaking from the perspective of a counselor, um, you know, ethically, we, we have an ethical responsibility to um, know when to uh, let uh, counseling, to know when the counseling needs to end. Um, and that comes from how we go about setting goals and direction with our clients. And so when, there, when there's a determination with the client as to when, when they, what they want to accomplish with their client, with their counseling and when that needs to end. But it also can come a, come a time um, especially with when I'm, if what I'm hearing from this, this particular pastor, there are things that can be ongoing with some pastors um, that there does need to be a place. So that can be a monthly or bi-monthly meeting that they have with their therapist um, that doesn't need to be weekly. Um, so yeah, it can be 
a little bit longer, but it doesn't need to be weekly that they're meeting with their counselor. Okay, we would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar today. We are so um, grateful for you for spending your time with us. Um, I just wanna say, if you have any other topics that you feel would be um, beneficial to the pastoral community, feel free to email them to me at daylaydjordan at ajordan at gordonconwall.edu. And as we continue with our webinars, we will certainly um, try to facilitate those topics for you. So thank you so very much to our panelists, um, faculty. We thank you to the media services for supporting us and for all of you who trusted us with your time. And I hope you all took away something that was very helpful for you. Thank you. Bye-bye.